flying at 70,000 feet above the world at three times the speed of sound, floats the future of intercontinental combat. So much so that the US Air Force called it the last manned bomber. This aviation platform was so versatile that the military planned a range of future versions from supersonic refueling, medical evac, to even passengers. But this 1950s miracle aircraft would never enter production, and the what if only remains on paper. This is the lost future we never had, the legendary XB-70 Valkyrie Super Bomber. The 1950s and early 1960s was an era shaped by the space age and all things galactic and futuristic. It was a period of engineering projects, movies, design and pop culture filled with feverish, sometimes outlandish dreams of the what not too distant future would look like. Flying cars, gleaming cities with highways in the sky and human colonies on Mars and mass tourism in space. It was all possible, so it was thought, and just around the corner. The aviation industry was not immune from this excitement about its technologically perfect world with unlimited possibilities. Aircraft engineers of the time had visions of the planes of the future that could be made from composite materials never thought of before, and that could even defy the laws of physics. One just has to look back at some of the fantastical, even crazy aircraft designs proposed during this era to know it was the case. Considering this statement by analysis regarding one of the largest military aviation projects of the 1950s, engineers hoped that one vehicle, one that they perceived as the last man bomber, could change the future of aerial bombardment. Essentially, what was intended was the bomber to beat all other bombers right out of the skies. That ill-fated plane was the XB-70 Valkyrie Super Bomber, and its many suggested variations will be the focus of today's video. So strap in, grab some popcorn, and let's get into it. The XB-70 Valkyrie was an experimental high-speed delta-wing aircraft that was developed by North American Aviation, or NAA, as part of the United States Air Force. It strength up the concept for the XB-70 in 1954 with a contract for its Air Force weapon system 110A competition between two American aircraft manufacturers, Boeing and the NAA. It was the NAA proposal that was awarded the contract finally on December 23rd, 1957. The intent was for the XB-70 to be very large, very fast strategic bomber meant to replace the legendary and hugely successful Boeing fighter bomber, the B-52. The new super bomber would need to be capable of carrying nuclear and conventional weapons. Interestingly, a key aspect of the Air Force contract was that the NAA was also the prime contractor for the weapon systems as well as the aircraft, which you may know at the time was almost unheard of. This Valkyrie would have a crew of four, namely a pilot, co-pilot, bombardier and defensive system operator. The XB-70 was to be 196 feet or 59.7 meters in length and its tail stood it to a height of 31 feet or 9.4 meters. The plane would weigh at an estimate maximum gross weight of 521,000 pounds or 235 kilograms. Its delta wings spanned an impressive 105 feet or 32 meters, with the wings swept at just over 65 degrees. This plane also had two large vertical tails. With its engines, it could push the plane out to a decent range of 4,288 miles or 6,900 kilometers. Although not a huge range, would still be considerable given the incredible cruising speed the plane could attain. Its service ceiling was also especially attractive, an incredible high altitude of 77,000 feet or 23.5 thousand meters, which equated to 14 miles or 23 kilometers up in the air. Also noteworthy and downright impressive were the plane's braking gears, which weighed more than six tons in total. To give an idea of just how much this aircraft had to be stopped by its braking system, consider this. 
A single stop for the plane would absorb the kinetic energy equivalent of that needed to suddenly stop 800 medium-sized cars traveling at a speed of 100 miles per hour which is just ridiculous. But there were also such hopes for this super fast super bomber that many different variations regarding its potential were proposed for the XB-70 that they're worth looking into. Five of the more interesting proposed variations of the super bomber included the following. A reconnaissance platform, diagrams were revealed to show an XB-70 filled with a rotary bomb racks in its bomb bay, this proposed variant was dubbed the RSB-70 with RSB standing for Reconnaissance Strike Bomber. This version would also incorporate an integral reconnaissance camera package which would have enabled the plane to collect bomb damage assessment imagery after it had struck its target. This configuration actually became standard on Air Force bombers including the B-52, B-1 and B-2 a few decades later. The XB-70 would have also been a fuel-hungry aircraft, so this version of the same plane would have been used as a tanker to refuel other XB-70s during missions. The logistics of such a large air tanker refueling an equally large aircraft with their supersonic shock waves during supersonic travel at high altitude it did leave some aviation pundits thinking this version was highly improbable. It was also thought that the XB-70 could be put to use as a commercial transporter for passengers and cargo. There was even talk of a medical version that could be configured to include a nursing station along with patient beds for up to 48 wounded persons in travel. This transporter variation was actually the most practical of all of the configurations given that the project would greatly influence various subsequent projects for supersonic commercial airliners, including Boeing supersonic transport and the highly popular, more successful Concorde jet. The focus here was for the XB-70 to act as a type of mothership for launching various kinds of payloads housed in modified bomb bays. It's interesting to note that the prototype diagrams indicated that various kinds of engines could be mounted to the XB-70's bomb bay, including ramjets and pulse jets for ballistic missiles. It was even later suggested that Minuteman ICBMs could be launched at high altitudes from a modified XB-70. Now, where have I seen that before? And the last and possibly most fascinating was to use this mothership concept to launch payloads into space. This was perhaps the most fanciful of all the proposed versions, but it's quite interesting to look into. These space-directed payloads included launching rockets carrying spy satellites, as well as even a manned space capsule for the Gemini program. All of these variations, none of which ever came to be, were divulged in a fascinating document called the NAA B-70 Valkyrie Variants, a future that never was. So why did it never happen? The XB-70 was full of new and experimental technologies. These included an exotic new type of boron-based fuel known colloquially as zip fuel. It was more energy dense than gasoline or jet fuel and its advantage, so the thinking was at the time, that would offer jets greater range and speed advantages. The plane would have six General Electric J93GE3 turbojet engines that produced a massive 28,000 pounds of thrust each and that would need to be burning this special fuel to attain such a blue speed. Each of the engines would also have an afterburner with the six engines located side by side in a large pod underneath the fuselage. They would be fueled by two large rectangular inlet ducts that provided two-dimensional airflow and thus improved the aerodynamic efficiency of the aircraft. The plane would also feature what has been dubbed a retractable windscreen for when the plane attained Mark III flight. This movable screen was comprised of a windshield and ramp that would be raised during supersonic flight in order to reduce drag. The assembly would be lowered once the plane needed to land so both the pilot and co-pilot would have a clear view of the runway. Another technological breakthrough was that even though the XB-70 was a big bird, 
was that it would be kept lighter thanks to an extensive use of titanium and lightweight honeycomb panelling made of stainless steel. Titanium would allow the plane to survive sustained aircraft skin temperatures ranging from 475 to 630 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 246 to 332 degrees Celsius for my non-American viewers. The high strength honeycomb skin that sandwiched the titanium was manufactured by joining metal to metal with brazing rather than the usual welding. That brazing technique would later become widely used throughout the aerospace industry. So you saw it here first folks. There was even more ingenuity with the XB-70. The plane introduced a aerodynamic theory called compression lift, in which its fuselage would create a shockwave at supersonic speed. An inlet wedge at the front of the delta wings would create a disturbance during this shock wave, causing a slowing down and build up of pressure under the wings. This would generate up to 40 pounds or 18 kilograms per square foot of additional lift when it was traveling at Mach 3. Furthermore, a third of the wing could fold down to as much as 65 degrees as to increase the directional stability and cruise efficiency as well as sustain the shock wave at such a high speed. In effect, the B-70 was designed to ride its own shock wave akin to how a surfer rides an ocean wave. That's quite an adventure. The first flight of the XB-70 Valkyrie finally took place on September 21st, 1964, nearly seven years after the contract had been awarded. In attendance on that day at Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, were 5,000 employees and guests who gathered in excitement to watch the Chief Pilot Elvin White and US Air Force co-pilot Joseph Cotton take the graceful giant into the sky. However, the first XB-70 was quickly found to have poor directional stability above Mark 2.5. Only one flight above Mark 3 was ever attempted. NAA engineers went on to build a second version of the plane, the XB-70A. This version had an added 5 degrees of dihedral on the wings and the immediate result was a plane with much better handling. This updated version of the XB-70 achieved Mark III for the first time on January 3rd, 1966 and would make a total of 9 Mark III flights by June of that very year. Unfortunately, things went terribly wrong on June 8th, 1966 when a mid-air collision took place between the XB-70A and an F-104 Starfighter. The accident happened during a close formation between the plane and four other aircraft, an F-4 Phantom, an F-5 and a T-38 Talon, in which the Starfighter got caught in the massive wake of the giant plane. The pilot was killed upon impact and one of the other pilots of the XB-70 died when the plane crashed. The other pilot on the Valkyrie was able to inject in time, although he sustained massive injuries. With the second prototype completely and utterly destroyed, there were serious doubts about the availability of the original prototype of the plane. Testing of the original XB-70 did go on, with the project even being taken over by NASA. However, studies conducted by NASA found that the huge aircraft would generate overpressures at high speed that were severely enough to shake the integrity of the plane. The studies showed that the shock waves converged when the plane made a turn and this would double the overpressure on the ground. The XB-70 was doomed to fail. However, there were other compelling reasons why the project finally got the axe. A principal reason why the XB-70 failed was because of the fast-growing emergence of surface-to-air missile technology at the time. The Soviet Union had introduced surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs as they're known in military circles, in the late 1950s, which suddenly put the US on a back foot. This meant that the XB-70 would now have to fly low instead of high in order to evade these surface-based missiles. Unfortunately, the XB-70 offered little additional performance compared to the B-52 bomber at that altitude, which it was supposed to replace. The XB-70 was also a lot more expensive and had a far shorter range than the B-52. Intercontinental ballistic missile technology would be a further death blow to the very expensive manned bomber project, which cost roughly 700 million per prototype. 
This all explains why the Air Force only ever bothered to have two prototypes of the aircraft ever produced. The project did linger on until 1969, where it was used by NASA to conduct experimental aerospace research, but it was eventually retired. In closing, a notable achievement of the NAA XB-70 was that it remains both the largest and heaviest aircraft to ever attain and fly at Mark III. There is also no denying that the XB-70 and XB-70A programs did much to add to what is known about supersonic flight at up to Mach 3 speeds, not to mention the incredible breakthroughs in technology and composite design due to the project. For that legacy alone, the doomed Valkyrie deserves a huge amount of respect. Speaking of respect, if you enjoyed this video today, then I would love for you to subscribe. I try to make these videos at least once a week, so if you don't want to miss an episode, then click that happy little red button down the bottom. And if you want to support the channel further, then we have channel members and Patreon. You get to see videos early, suggest future topics, and talk to me in the Discord. I can't wait to see you later. Thanks for watching, 